Hi, I'm David. And I'm Toby. And we're sitting on what remains of the largest Homo Polar generator ever built. A Homo Polar generator works by rotating a conductive disc in a magnetic field. This creates a DC electrical current between the center and rim of the disc. Homopolar generators produce relatively low voltages, but very large currents, which makes them useful for a range of science experiments. So Toby, this thing's sitting outside your building. What do you know about it? Surprisingly, even though I walk past this almost every day, I don't know a lot about it. Um, the things I do know are that this was a foundational piece of equipment in the research school of um, physics here at ANU. I know that um, there is maybe some problems along the way making it. I've heard rumors that it was either behind time or cost more than they expected. Um, but in terms of what it actually does, I don't know a lot about that. So maybe you can help me. Yeah, so this was a generator built by or developed by a team led by Sir Mark Oliphant, the mm. founding father of the physics building here. He was a nuclear physicist, he worked on some of the earliest particle accelerators and when he set up the physics department at ANU he wanted to equip it with a world-class particle accelerator and he designed a particle accelerator that would be more powerful than anything else in the world at the time and so he needed a huge power source to power it. Right. So that's what this thing was for. Hmm. It had these two huge 40-ton discs wow, that yeah. would be spun up with electricity from the grid over a period of about 15 minutes and so these two discs would be storing about 560 megajoules of energy then they would switch on huge magnetic coils that would create a magnetic field that these discs were spinning through and it would dump all this energy in less than two seconds and create this massive two megajoule billion watt pulse of electricity wow so what would you use that electricity for so that electricity would be to use to create the enormous potentials that would drive the protons down the accelerator at near the speed of light right but unfortunately he was trying to do this on what by particle accelerator standards was a shoestring budget still a lot of money but shoestring by the standards of these this huge equipment and so that meant there were cost overruns time blew out and by the time the generator was finished, and they hadn't even finished building the synchrotron, it had been eclipsed by other particle accelerators around the world. Wow. So was it useless then, or what happened to no. it? No. So they started building this in about 1951, they finished in about 1964, and they did get more than 20 years of good use out of it, because there are lots of other experiments you can use huge current sources for. So they used it here for things like high power laser experiments, plasma experiments, uh, safety systems for high tension electrical equipment, and railgun research. Wow. <laughs> so they didn't break it up until the mid 80s and they did get a lot of good use out of it. Yeah, it sounds like they did. So this was a huge engineering challenge. That's why it took so long to build. Just simple things like how to couple the electricity out of it were a huge challenge. Do you know what they did? No, I don't. Well, they couldn't use carbon brushes like in an electric motor, so they had to use liquid metal slip rings. Right. Do you have any idea what metal they might have used? The only liquid metal I know is maybe mercury. Mercury might have been the better choice. There's an alloy of sodium and potassium called NAC. It's liquid at room temperature. And unlike mercury, it doesn't create toxic vapors, but it does catch fire on contact with air. <laughs> And that's what they were using. But behind this panel, you can actually see some of the jets that would have sprayed liquid NAC yeah. onto the giant discs to get the electricity out of it. But it had problems. There was an accident and a researcher was blinded during the development of this. Wow. You're, you're building something pretty incredible when you have to seriously consider that several gallons of mercury might be the safer option. Yeah, it does look pretty incredible and I think Maybe the fact they've put it out here as a sculpture means what it meant to the people of the school. It's great to, it's huge. It's amazing to see in person. I've seen pictures of Mark Oliphant standing between the two huge magnets. There, it's the height of a man between yeah. the magnets. That's just amazing, but it's great to see in person. It's just so much bigger in real life. 
and I'm really glad to see this sculpture's here and that's why I wanted to visit it because I do think it's a tribute to the amazing engineers and physicists who work in this building and to the visionaries who drive science and humanity forward by discovering new things and building new things. Toby, thanks for showing me around your oh, building. Thanks for explaining this to me and you're welcome. Hi everyone, sorry about the poor sound quality. I hope you found the video interesting anyway. And a huge thanks to Toby for showing me around the physics building and taking the time to film with me. Go check out her channel, she's awesome and posts a lot of interesting videos. See you next time.